Okay. Uh, may I begin now? Uh, okay. Not now. Just a uh, ladies and gentlemen, this thing is ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Huala Dol. I'm from Indonesia. And on behalf of the Thailand Arbitration Center, I would like to welcome all of you to attend the THAC International ADR Webinar Series 2020. The seminar this afternoon will talk about an interesting topic on arbitration rules entitled the procedural innovations in arbitration to achieve efficiency, myth or reality. The topic uh, would relate closely with the COVID-19 outbreak. COVID-19 outbreak has severely affected social, economic, cultural, and law. It closed down schools, offices, entertainment industries. It has, it has hit economic sectors badly. However, COVID-19 provided opportunities. It has triggered people to adopt innovative maneuver to enable them to adapt to the new situations which is more efficient and effective than the former ways. Uh, take for instance, uh, our seminar this afternoon. Before COVID-19, I never imagined an international seminar like we have now with speakers from different continents may talk together at the same time irrespective of their different location and time. Before the outbreak to hold a single international seminar usually takes months of preparations. The organizing committee would seek and, re and ran a ballroom or seminar room in a hotel which is very expensive one. The invited, the invited speakers would book their flights and hotel rooms and of course other costs for the travel from their country to the seminar venue. This takes much time, energy and money. The organizing committee would send invitation letters to the potential participants to attend the seminar. This also requires time and energy. The main idea of the seminar is that COVID-19 outbreak provided opportunities to arbitration. Most arbitration institutions in Asia, America, Europe, Australia have been affected their services and operation due to the COVID-19. The stop of the service affected the parties in disputes. During the lockdown of many towns, sports, airlines in the world, many arbitration institutions Having a single COVID-19 outbreak also provide an opportunity to arbitration, especially to the changes of arbitration rules to adapt to the new situation under the COVID-19. Uh, arbitration rules provide rather easy room for changes to meet a better surface, more efficient to arbitration, and also, of course, to the parties in dispute. In this session, the panel will share their valuable experience and knowledge with regard to the situation and to what extent the arbitration rules has been adopted or changed to the new situations. These speakers are well-known persons and leaders they are experts in arbitration and, and have talked about various issues on arbitration in many seminars. The first 
The first speaker is, is Stephen Lim. He is a Singaporean and lawyer based in Singapore. He is an independent arbitrator and barrister with 39 ASEC chambers based in Singapore. He had over 65 appointments as arbitrator and also takes instructions as lead counsel in international arbitrations. He has been recognized as a leading individual international arbitration in chambers and legal 500 where he has been noted as hugely experienced, a respected arbitrator, very impressive advocate, is respected for his incisive mind and uh, pierce point out his sharp intellect. I will talk about the innovation on rules adopted by a number of arbitration institutions on the procedure on the procedural rules. The second speaker, Lars Merkert, if I correctly uh, pronounce it, a German lawyer, is a foreign law partner at Nishimura and Akashi, uh, Tokyo office. He is admitted to the German and New York bars, a registered foreign lawyers in Japan, and advise clients in both investor state and international commercial arbitration. Lars has experience in representing investors and states in proceeding under the exit convention, the unsuitable arbitration rules, and advice, advising on potential claims under bilateral investment treaties and related negotiation strategies. Uh, he holds a investment arbitration from the of phone on the topic of the dispute settlement clauses in agreement. is an academic advisor to the International Investment Law Center Cologne, teaches investment law and procedure at the University of Cologne, and regularly speaks and publishes on issues of commercial investment arbitration. Uh, Lars would also talk about the rules from his own perspective. And the third speaker is a professor of international law. Uh, professor Skari Kul is a professor of law at Transit University. We will talk about international disputes and we we'll look into its uh, relation with the uh, arbitration rules. Uh, each speaker will give his presentation in 10 to 50, 50 minutes. After the presentation, the audience, the participant, may ask questions or comments. And please uh, make your questions through the uh, chat room. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have, uh, we are now. Uh, it's my honor to invite, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Stephen Lim to give your presentations. Mr. Lin, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Adolf, for that, for that introduction. Uh, as we had uh, discussed earlier, uh, Lars and I are actually going to, to do a, a joint presentation. We thought it'd be more interesting since we're covering similar topics that we will be uh, having a, a more of a dialogue between us uh, rather than discrete presentations. And I'll just briefly introduce what we will discuss. Uh, before handing it over to Lars to kick us off. We will be covering two aspects of uh, uh, what you, uh, Professor Adolf, mentioned. One, we will look at procedural innovations pre-COVID-19 uh, and examine whether these uh, add to procedural uh, efficiency in arbitration. Uh, one of the aspects we'll be talking about will be early determination. Lars will look at that from the perspective of investment arbitration, and I will look at that from the perspective of commercial arbitration. Uh, and then on the second part, we are going to talk about how the embrace of technology, which you have mentioned, Dr. Edo, uh, opens up new opportunities for efficiencies in arbitration, uh, how we can use existing procedural innovations and is, uh, is existing procedural techniques, but with the medium 
of technology with the ability to conduct meetings like this on Zoom, how we may be able to deploy that for even greater efficiency in the arbitral process. So uh, roughly between last and I will be speaking for 30 minutes covering these two topics. I will let Lars begin. Thank you, Professor Adolf and, and Stephen. Thank you for, for providing the, the roadmap. Uh, thank you, of course, also for the, to the THAC for inviting us to speak. It's a, it's a great honor. Um, as, as Stephen has explained, uh, initially we'll, we'll cover some of the pure procedural developments in, in international arbitration that are supposed to lead to more efficiency. And, and I'm taking over the, the investment arbitration aspect. And, and to, to give a, a bit of a, a sub roadmap within that topic, um, when you look at investment arbitration and procedural innovations, I think you can distinguish two types of procedural innovations. One type are procedural innovations that actually originate from the investment arbitration sphere and, and have become successful and then have been taken up by the commercial arbitration sphere. And as Stephen just mentioned it, um, the early determination procedure, or, or as, as it's sometimes called, the summary dismissal procedure is, is one of those. And I'll, I'll address it later in more detail. Uh, but then there's an interesting second aspect uh, where you have things that look like procedural innovations in the area of investment arbitration, but when you come from the field of commercial arbitration, you will actually be saying, well, this is old news. So what, what makes those procedural innovations is that um, they're taken from the sphere of commercial arbitration, but are implanted into in, in the investment arbitration context where they haven't been used before. Um, and then uh, I, I want to close, this is still part of the roadmap, I want to close by giving some thought to the notion of efficiency uh, when you look at it in the context of investment arbitration. Is the notion of efficiency, is that the same notion that you would look at when you talk about commercial arbitration? So, so let me start um, with the procedural innovation in investment arbitration that probably look very familiar to commercial arbitration lawyers, but are somewhat of a novelty in investment arbitration. One of those is the use of emergency arbitrators. That is a very rare occurrence in investment arbitration. Um, it is basically only possible if you have um, an investment agreement that refers to the rules of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. But those rules basically apply to commercial arbitration and investment arbitrations alike. And so you've had uh, a number of emergency arbitrator proceedings in investment arbitrations. Um, and of course, just by way of a little bit of background, emergency arbitrator proceedings are usually foreseen um, in case you have an urgent need to have a decision before the tribunal is put in place. And uh, there have been a number of cases where basically in an investment arbitration, an emergency arbitrator has decided on issues relevant to the investment arbitration before the actual investment arbitration tribunal was put into place. And of course you can say, well, that's very efficient because it's very quick. Uh, whether that then covers all aspects of, of um, efficiency, I'll, I'll take a look at later. Um, another thing that um, now becomes more popular in investment arbitrations is expedited proceedings. So um, ICSID, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, it's currently, is currently amending its uh, arbitration rules. And one of the amendments it's gonna make is to provide for expedited proceedings. Uh, so very known thing from commercial arbitration, but a bit of a novelty in investment arbitrations. Um, I think also um, uh, some set of rules, and uh, especially I think you're kind of starting in Singapore, had, had shortened deadlines. Um, and I think um, Ixit is, is, is taking this up. And, and so the, when, you, when you draft arbitral rules for investment arbitrations, I think that's, that's also um, with a view to more efficiency, uh, the drafters are looking where can we actually shorten procedural deadlines. Um, 
then, uh, for example, ICSID is now uh, taking a bigger emphasis on electronic filings, so, so doing everything electronically, having uh, basically uh, a cloud system where, where all submissions are, are uploaded. Um, uh, you don't have to do paper filings anymore. Uh, that certainly improves efficiency and uh, also is environmental friendly. Uh, I think use of mediation, uh, again, that's, that's quite known in the commercial sphere, uh, is becoming much more prominent now uh, in investment arbitration. So this is another development. And when we look at the Uncentral Working Group 3, that's currently dealing with the reform of investor state dispute settlement, um, that uh, efficiency is probably not the largest concern. I think that is probably legitimacy of the system but I think efficiency is one sub aspect of that. So, so there's a lot of stuff that, uh, that is quite known in commercial arbitrations, but it's now kind of um, spilling over into investment arbitration. So what I've mentioned earlier, the, the other way around is the summary dismissal procedure that was initially uh, kind of, so to speak, invented or to, for the first time contained in the ICSI arbitration rules as, as, as the rule 41.5 that um, has proven quite successful uh, because particularly in these long running investment arbitrations, if you can shorten the process uh, by kicking out a claim very early, if you, if you can show that it's manifestly without legal merit, um, that, that is quite helpful. Um, and Stephen will talk about how arbitral institutions in the commercial sphere have picked it up and, and refined it, I would say. Um, Final point I want to make, I think efficiency in investment arbitration has to be looked at from a slightly different angle than maybe that in, in commercial arbitration. Very often efficiency, what we have in mind is that, uh, well, you have a fast proceeding at low cost and maybe ideally at, at high quality and high enforceability. And the question is, can you have all three or can you always only have two out of those three? Uh, but when it comes to, to investor state arbitration, I think you have to take into account that uh, governments are publicly accountable. They have to defend a certain regulatory space and, and there is uh, a need for transparency. And I think that has to flow into the, the notion of efficiency and it actually then makes it quite difficult to find procedural solutions that live up to that notion of efficiency. So, so these are my, my first ideas, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Stephen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lars, for, for, for that introduction. Uh, just a, a comment on, on what Lars had mentioned, and particularly on this aspect of uh, cross-fertilization between invest, the investment arbitration world and the commercial arbitration world. I think I agree with Lars that we're, we're seeing that quite a bit now, uh, and it does work two ways. And an interesting uh, example of that is actually what the SIAC has done. I mean, in 2016, the SIAC introduced uh, revisions to its commercial arbitration rules uh, in which it, it borrowed from ICSID the uh, early dismissal provisions, but also at the same time, they also introduced a, a set of investment arbitration rules. Uh, and those investment arbitration rules, and I don't know whether they've been used as yet, but you know, they're definitely there and available for selection by the parties, incorporate quite a few of the commercial practices that the SIEC ha had used effectively. And that also includes the emergency arbitrator provision. And in that case, admittedly, the parties have to expressly agree to it. But you can see there's, there's a bit of cross-fertilization uh, um, in that. And in, interestingly as well, in, in terms of the early dismissal provision, uh, they, the SIC refined the early pro dismissal provision in the commercial rules, uh, but then imported that also into the uh, into its set of the investment arbitration rules. So you do see that that cross fertilization happening uh, quite a bit. But let me let me move on and talk ab about early dismissal and and use this as an example by which uh, arbitral institutions uh, innovate. Uh, you know, whether by adapting rules from, from other institutions, adapting existing practices or coming up with, with new ideas, how these innovations can actually provide a toolkit for parties and tribunals to run a more efficient arbitration. So, and at last said that the early dismissal rule, uh, you know, was originated in investment treaty arbitration, but, you know, to some extent, the, this idea 
uh, of an early determination has been around for a long time in international arbitration because it's always been recognized uh, as part of the case, case administration powers of a tribunal uh, and, and many arbitration laws and rules recognize that a tribunal can issue more than one award so they can issue a partial award which means that they can hear preliminary issues. They can hear issues which, which may determine uh, an aspect of, of the claim or of the case and which, which will result in a saving of time and cost. So that has always been available. I think what the early dismissal rule um, in ICSID provided and, 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 and how this was then transformed in, in the commercial sphere by the SIC and other institutions uh, is that it formalizes this, this procedure. And it gives some structure to this procedure that, that helps, I think, encourages parties and tribunals to use this procedure. The preliminary determination had been around for a long time, but there was some, some comment made that, that tribunals were reluctant to use it uh, for fear of, of due process concerns. And also parties also, because they thought tribunals were reluctant to use it, would be reluctant to raise it. But if it's written into the rules, uh, it may actually encourage parties to use it. So let, let me focus on, on the introduction of this into the commercial sphere. It started with the SIC, the 2016 rules, but uh, as with many of these innovations, it then proliferates uh, quite, quite quickly. The uh, SCC introduced a, a, a similar provision uh, in 2017, uh, and then in 2018, the HKIC introduced a provision as well. The ICC came out and clarified that while it didn't introduce a provision, it said that this had always been within the, the remit of an arbitrator uh, under the ICC rules. And of course, going back to this idea that a preliminary determination had always been, uh, been available. Uh, and uh, LCIA very, very recently, just within this week, introduced its new rules, and it has also incorporated the early dismissal uh, idea. So you can see that w when someone has a good idea in international arbitration, uh, it gets adopted quite quickly. Now, wh what did the SIC do with, with, with the exit rule? It, 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 it adapted it. It didn't completely just copy the exit rule. It, it, there are some significant differences between the, X, S, the exit rule and the SIC rule. One is the SIC rules covers both claims and defenses. And because of the, of the exit nature of the case, I mean, that it only covers claims, it, it doesn't cover defenses. Now, the SIC rule expressly made it to cover legal merits and jurisdiction. Uh, and importantly and significantly, the SIC rules did not stipulate a time for when the application had to be made. So it allowed the parties to choose when this application could be made. And that is more in line with, with what would have been the procedure if the parties had adopted a preliminary issue. Uh, rather than something with, uh, uh, within this sort of structure. So it, it, it gives, it retains the flexibility um, for the parties. And, and that, I think, is a very important factor because from that evolution of the rule, I think the rule actually became somewhat revolutionary. Uh, and I say that because under the exit procedure, the application is made at a very, very early stage of the uh, arbitration. It has to be made within 30 days of constitution of the tribunal and in any event before the first session uh, of the tribunal. And at that stage, the only submission before the tribunal is the request for arbitration. That's the only material that the tribunal has. And therefore, when you look at the exit jurisprudence on this, uh, it talks about how the test of, of, of manifestly without legal merit is a very high test. It has to be clear and obvious, has to be uh, dispatch with, with relative ease. Uh, uh, and when this is transposed, though, to the commercial context and transposed to the context when this can be brought later in, in the stage, and it actually looked in the context when, when it's brought later in the stage, is actually much more similar to a preliminary determination than the exit procedure, then you know, what the exit jurisprudence, while really applicable to the situation where it's taken at a very early stage, may not necessarily or should not be applied um, to, to cases brought at a later stage, because at the later stage, when there's much more material before the tribunal, and it could well be the, the situation where the tribunal by that stage really has all the material it, it would have, even if they had gone to a final merits hearing. Uh, and in those circumstances, 
it, 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 caution has to be applied to say that there is a higher standard than, than a normal standard of proof, because I don't think there is. And, and I can say this with, with experience because I, I sat in the tribunal that heard one of the, the first applications uh, under Rule 29 and the SIC rule, and that was brought at a, a much later stage in the arbitration. And we had to grapple with the issue, and when I thought very hard about it, and of course, exit cases were cited, I came to the conclusion there isn't a, a higher standard uh, of proof on legal issues than, than, than is normally expected. I, I fully understand why in the exit case, the, the jurisprudence deals with it that way because it's taken to such an early stage. But in the commercial space and all the rules that I've cited, the SEC rules, the ICC rules, the LCIA rules, etc., they allow this flexibility of bringing it later in the stage. Uh, you know, all, all, all allow that. And in those situations, uh, you know, you, one has to be careful with, with application of the exit rules uh, in, in those situations. I, I make that point of saying that this is how the, the rules are adapted uh, and improved. Uh, a, a rule that is, that is used in one context is borrowed and adapted and improved, and it becomes a highly, highly useful tool. Now, if, if the, the rule were to just blindly take the exit rule and, but put it into this different context, I think that would create issues and difficulties uh, as I walk through it. But if we recognize that what has been evolutionary became revolutionary, then it, then it actually becomes uh, a, a process that can be used by the parties for procedural efficiency. Uh, and that's an example of how, you know, I think pre-COVID, that procedural innovations really could be brought to procedural efficiency. And, and one of the things that this touches on really is, uh, is more active case management from the parties, which would be something that we will discuss uh, as, uh, uh, as our st uh, stage two of our discussion. So at that point, let me hand it back to Lars. Thank you very much. Then let's go to stage two. <laughs> and, and just for the audience, um, in stage two, I think uh, rather than having uh, separate presentations, I think Steve, Stephen and I will just uh, hand it, pass it back and forth and, and, and share some, some experiences and thoughts. And I think we'll cover maybe even three perspectives because uh, we can do the, the investment versus commercial arbitration. Um, but but also, um, the first time my speaker is not working, is that the case? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, very good. So, uh, the second aspect might be uh, a bit simple or a common law tradition that, that could play a role in, in, in these situations. So, um, to, to start out, I think uh, coming back to COVID 19. Uh, the, the big thing, of course, the big change and the maybe increase of efficiency is virtual hearings. Uh, now, to address it uh, from the arbitration perspective, again, um, arbitrary institutions have been very quick uh, to start implementing this. I, I think, in a, in a way, a bit of a virtual was always there. You had quite often you had witnesses. Um, Dialing in virtually to give testimony. I think what is, what is really new and, and really has been sped up by COVID is to have full virtual events and uh, both uh, or like exit the PCA, they, they've been working hard uh, to, to make that possible and to create this and to set this up. And uh, in that it, it might be even more in more difficult because there's a large number of participants, you have the state parties that they need to be fully comfortable with the process, uh, that cyber uh, security um, is, is dealt with. I think for now I hand it back over to Steve. I see uh, I get some comments that something is wrong with my microphone. So maybe Stephen, you'll, you'll pick up and I'll check what's going on. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, Lars. So uh, yeah, as Lars picked up, I think What's happened with COVID-19 has actually opened up a, a very, very interesting, uh, probably not, not by design, but by chance, but very interesting uh, opportunities for looking at how we deploy existing procedural if, uh, uh, techniques and, and existing ideas about efficiency in arbitration, uh, uh, using technology and, and making it more uh, efficient. And, 
And what I have in mind particularly is this quick adoption uh, of everyone to, to doing things online, uh, on video, uh, as we are doing now uh, on, on the Zoom technology. Uh, I can't imagine uh, in, in January or February before COVID really hit the, the world that the, the arbitration world would have so readily uh, embraced this use of technology. I mean, before this, uh, either the parties met in person in a particular location, which as Professor Adolf mentioned, involved a lot of traveling and time, uh, or uh, before that happened and, and, and issues needed to be dealt with, uh, they, would, they would adopt a telephone conference, which worked to some extent, but wasn't ideal. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, because of COVID-19, uh, everyone has quickly embraced the idea that, that we, we adopt this technology like Zoom, which frankly had been around for a while, but somehow because of maybe of the conservative nature uh, of lawyers, uh, we, were, we were uncomfortable with just trying something new, but because of COVID-19, we're forced to. And suddenly we realize that, that this medium opens up uh, many, many possibilities for, for, imp for testing ideas that everyone has been talking about for a long time. And, and let me pick on, uh, on two of these. One is the idea of active case management. Uh, the, the arbitration world has been talking for a long time about how to be more efficient. And one of the ideas is that the tribunal should actively manage the case rather than have, have your procedural meeting number one, which in any event may not be in person, usually it might have been by telephone. Uh, and then you set out the timetable. And then, you know, you don't expect to, to see or hear from the parties again uh, until you actually have your final hearing, maybe one year later where somebody, everybody gathers uh, in, in the same location. Uh, some cases may well still work that way, but it may, uh, cases generally may benefit from having more active case management, the tribunal following the case uh, at a much earlier stage, getting on top of the case at a much earlier stage, giving input to the parties as to, based on, on the material that has been given by the parties to the tribunal, how the tribunal sees the case, giving more direction uh, to the case. Uh, you know, the idea here is that we probably have more frequent case management conferences. And one of the, the possibilities that COVID-19 has opened up with the use of Zoom is that this actually makes it very, very viable. Since COVID-19 has started, I have done uh, virtual hearings, entirely virtual using this sort of platform. All my case management conferences now uh, are conducted via Zoom. There's so much that you can do on Zoom. Uh, you can see everyone, you, you, so you don't just hear someone, you, you can see them, you can, you can, you have all the benefits of an in-person uh, hearing. I would say it's, it's almost 95% of being you know, in person. Uh, you can even record on Zoom. And Zoom would even produce a transcript for you uh, if you ask it. Not a perfect transcript, but at least some sort of transcript. So there's so much that can be done uh, on the simple platform. And it's so much easier to get together if necessary uh, to have a Zoom conference. And you don't need to travel. You, you can pick a time and people can sit at their desk and, and enter into this. So it really opens up the possibility of, of much more active case management. And it also opens up the possibility that the parties will try certain techniques that have been talked about a lot, but probably not used so much because of the, the cost of traveling. One is something called the Kaplan opening or, or an early opening of the case, which had been introduced by a well-known arbitrator, Neil Kaplan, quite a few years ago, but I haven't really heard being used very much. Uh, and perhaps one of the issues there was it takes time and cost to get everybody together for half a day, travel around the world, to do this, this early opening where the, where the council give an introduction to the case, to the tribunal at a really, relatively early stage. Now, if, if this is done by Zoom, uh, then that constraint of, of time and cost to some extent goes away. So we could see more adoption of that. Uh, another innovation that, that had been discussed were uh, this pertaining more to the tribunals, and this came from Lucy Reed uh, uh, as a uh, counterpoint to the Kaplan opening is called the Reed Retreat, in that the tribunal should get together before the hearing to having read all the material to discuss the issues in, in, in the case so that when we get to the hearing, they would, they would be familiar with the issues, they would know how each other thinks about it, uh, and they'll be more ready to engage with the, with the parties on it. Again, it's probably not something I've seen done too much, again, perhaps because of the cost, but again, if you can do this on Zoom, then uh, the, the barriers to doing this, you know, to some extent, fall away. 
Um, so what what I see actually is uh, with with this adoption of technology is one there'll be more active case management, uh, and the other issue picking up on something that Lars mentioned as well is that even with how we we structure our arbitrations, you know, could well change. I mentioned the 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 prototypical arbitration when I began this part of the first presentation saying you have your procedural number one uh, and then you don't meet again until one year later you have this final hearing where everybody meets. But if with this facility or Zoom where you can have more frequent meetings, you could have a different kind of, of, of hearing. You can structure it differently. You can perhaps adopt a more inquisitorial approach. You can break the hearing up into chunks uh, if, if that made a lot more sense and you can have then uh, many hearings over a period of time, getting together via this medium, rather than structuring everything so that you, you have uh, everything heard uh, at, at, at the end. So at that point, let me hand it back to Lars and get his reactions to, to some of these things that I've been mentioning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very interesting. I, I think in, in that sense, uh, I think investment arbitration and commercial arbitration are not that different. Uh, because that's that's really a, a simple procedural way of, of increasing efficiency. Um, as, I, as I tried to say earlier, um, sometimes states are a bit more concerned about cyber security and, and so I know that certain investment arbitral uh, institutions would not use Zoom uh, because um, when COVID-19 broke out the pandemic, it, it was indeed, uh, there were some issues with security. I think they have been fixed now, but but still um, that lingers on. So you have to use certain programs to do your video conferencing. So there's slight differences. But I think when we, we talk about efficiency, the important thing that Steve Stephen mentioned is uh, the opportunity to more easily meet up to avoid travel costs. I think that's that can be a, a significant factor, um, is especially, um, I mean, coming from Europe and doing an investment arbitration in Europe, I mean, either you meet in, in, in Paris, in The Hague or DC, so you, you have to travel to these places. Um, and, and of course, that, that can make a big, big difference uh, if, if you meet via video conferencing. Uh, to pick up one, one point Stephen mentioned, um, and that's now less from an investment arbitration perspective, perspective but more from the perspective of a, a German lawyer and a civil law lawyer, when I did arbitrations in Germany, one, one thing tribunals did um, quite successfully is to have what, what we called a midstream conference. So after the first round of submission, have a, a one day hearing where basically the parties lay out their positions, but also interestingly, uh, the tribunal gave uh, first views about the case and, and what it wanted to hear from the parties or what it wanted the parties to emphasize on in the second round of submissions. And that, uh, that proved very helpful uh, once because uh, every now and then the case settled at that point because the parties became aware that, that one key issue, one key argument would not fly. And without that, the, the, the case would not make sense. Or if the case didn't settle, uh, the parties knew much better what they should focus on for the second round of submissions. And I think with the means of video conferencing, uh, that has become much easier. And I think that could be a, a way to really, really improve efficiency. I think the, the Kaplan opening is, is somewhat of the same idea, but it, it, it steps in a slightly later, at a slightly later time and tries to streamline the hearing. Uh, but I think you can even start earlier. And, and as Stephen said, I mean, with video conferencing and avoiding the travel costs, uh, you could actually potentially build in both of these steps. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, indeed there, there is an improvement. I think of course there, there are some downsides to video conferencing uh, that maybe still uh, once uh, travel opens up again, makes it, reduces it again. Uh, I, I think one, one thing is if you have long uh, virtual hearings and I had some of those, uh, it's very tiring. So I, I thought it was more tiring than sitting in a room with people. Um, also, of course, you, you suddenly have to struggle with different time zones. So I had a hearing where my co-arbitrators were in Europe. So we had to start uh, very late in the day in Asia, but very early in their day in, in Europe. Um, or uh, I have an upcoming hearing where, where basically uh, the seat is in Asia, but the, a lot of the experts and witnesses come from the United States. 
So basically our hearing day is broken up uh, into morning sessions and night sessions. So that, that makes it uh, in, in a way more uncomfortable, but nevertheless, I mean, it allows us to, to proceed. Uh, and I think that that is efficient in a, in a sense. It's, it's maybe in, in some ways less comfortable than, than it was uh, all sitting in one room. But um, depending, very much depending on the case, I think uh, there, there's a lot of like shorter hearings that you can do um, where it absolutely makes sense. Um, I, you know, just reacting to what you said, Lars, I, I agree with you. This is, we're not talking about polar situation where, where we have a virtual world and everything should be done virtually and we have a physical world and everything should be done physically. Uh, what, what this has opened up is that it gives you the, the choice to, to mix it up. Uh, I don't think virtual hearings would, would entirely replace physical hearings. Yes, there will still be a need for physical hearings. But what it opens up is this possibility uh, of, of the, you know, having more interaction between the tribunal and the parties, which, which, is, in, which is different from, from, from dealing with it uh, on, on paper. You know, if, if we didn't have this kind of medium, either we meet in person, or, or we start with on paper, or you have the telephone, but the telephone isn't ideal as well. And the, some of the issues of the telephone was you can't see uh, the, the individual who's making the submission. I think you lose quite a bit without having that, that image too. You, you, you're not, sometimes you get awkward pauses because you don't know when that person has ended. Uh, and then you have this awkward pause because you're trying to you know, you figure out whether he's finished, or you end up cutting across each other because you thought he's finished. Uh, and, and then you're jumping in. So having this kind of medium gives the possibility that it's easier to meet in person uh, together like this and have a dialogue between the tribunal and the parties, which I think is an entirely different process to, to having exchanges uh, via, via email or, 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 or written submissions. And, and what this opens up, I think, is so that we can start playing around. Tribunals and parties can be encouraged to start moving away from one prototype, prototypical form of, of, of a process for arbitration uh, and start adapting it to, to the particular circumstances of the case before them, to the circum particular circumstances of the parties before them uh, and the counsel involved and the arbitrator involved. Uh, and, and instead of having one prototypical type of arbitration, you may find that there are many different ways in which it can be done because this technology, this medium opens up this possibility that, that we, can, we, can, we can do things differently. I, I can only say I fully agree. <laughs> I, I, looking at the time, I think we, we better hand it back to Professor Weller Adolf. <laughs> Professor Adolf, do you wanna, wanna take over again? Yes, thank you, Stephen and Lars. Now uh, uh, we we move to. I'd like to invite Professor Sukhariku to give your presentation to us, Professor. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, have you hear my voice? First of all, I uh, would like yes. to. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, my presentation uh, will uh, deal uh, mostly with the issues, the legal issues, which may arise. Uh, because of the COVID-19, both uh, substantively and procedurally. And I think it should be a good idea that I share my, uh, my screen because uh, I have a limited time uh, and I may not be able to uh, uh, raise all the issues involved. But anyway, uh, you can see from the screen. Uh, may I uh, put, uh, share my screen now? All right. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see my screen, okay? Uh, the two speaker has already mentioned about the effect of the COVID-19. Uh, I will not delve into uh, the effect uh, anymore, uh, but what I would like to say is uh, about the quarantine measures. Uh, I think a large number of health quarantine measures are employed by many states. Some medical equipment or apparatus, uh, such as medical masks or alcohol are prohibited from importing or exporting. Uh, several plans are requisitioned uh, to operate only for the sake of supporting uh, governmental measures to control the disease. And uh, a large number uh, of uh, 
companies and plants have been uh, adjourned operation and many of them has been bankrupt. Uh, what would happen? Uh, what would its effects upon uh, arbitration? Uh, the phenomena has, uh, co have caused uh, many issues pertaining to arbitration, uh, both uh, procedurally and uh, substantively, uh, especially with regard to investment, which uh, Mr. Lali has already mentioned. Uh, and when we talk about uh, 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 issues uh, pertaining to uh, investment, uh, it could involve uh, ISDS, uh, Investor State uh, Dispute Settlement, uh, which may arise out from uh, the so-called bilateral in investment treaties. Uh, I, I will rest about the issues on in terms of substance first. Uh, I just raised the issue and maybe uh, the two gentlemen can, can, uh, can respond. Uh, first of all, can a state impose uh, health quarantine measures without regard to its commitment under the BIT? Because the BIT say that you have to uh, 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 protect the investor all the time. Okay. Can, uh, can the state measures uh, amounting to uh, measures of indirect expropriation, measure tantamount to expropriation, or measure having equivalent effects to expropriation? All the first uh, appear in many BITs. Okay. Can the state measure be regarded as a violation of the fair and equitable treatment? Can it be said that the government measures violates the full and constant protection and security? Can the state invoke exception under the BIT such as force majeure, duress, necessity, national security, health measure, and so on to justify its action? And uh, can the state uh, invoke self-defense or preservation or the police power uh, to justify its action? Uh, in case where several companies are bankrupt, must arbitration process be automatically stayed according to uh, the internal law of uh, virtually all states in the world? Yeah. Once the bankruptcy starts, uh, everything has to be stopped. And all the claim has to be run under the bankruptcy process, okay? And in case where arbitration award uh, has already been rendered or has been done online, which is uh, a pertinent case here, will that award it be fully recognized and enforced uh, under the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Arbitral Award? Uh, I, I will say to you uh, about the procedural problem later on. Uh, the fair and equitable treatment is very interesting substantively uh, because it has been interpreted to be an obligation of the whole state not to do or not to act or uh, not to do anything which will negatively affect, disrupt, or damage foreign investor and their investment, as well as to impair the legitimate expectation of the investor. These whole state action, I mean the quarantine actions mentioned above. Uh, can be regarded as the measure having equivalent effect to expropriation, which I have already uh, talked about uh, earlier on. Uh, I may skip the uh, uh, full protection and security. Uh, in terms of procedure, uh, arbitration procedure have to be taken somewhere by all parties, as you know, because you cannot travel. Uh, all airlines have stopped. Okay? Uh, you cannot even in my country, Thailand, you cannot move from one province to another. Okay. Uh, this is a state quarantine. Yeah. So uh, it is in the, in, indispensable that uh, you have only one option left. If you are going to go on with the arbitration, you have to do it online. But what are the issues involved if you are going to do the arbitration online? Okay. Uh, my, my first question that I would raise for your, your thinking, uh, for, you, for the food for your thought, uh, whether pending arbitration uh, be adjourned until the COVID subside. Uh, and a very interesting case uh, in this, uh, I think in my opinion, uh, which state is the place of arbitration? If the persons involved in arbitration process are in different states, such as the complaining party is in state A, a responding party is in state B, an arbitrator or arbitrators are in state C, but the server is in state D. Uh, which country that you regard as the place of arbitration? 
because the place of arbitration is very important under the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Award because uh, a contracting parties may, uh, uh, may state very clearly that uh, it will recognize only uh, that the, 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 the award that has been made in uh, another contracting party. Okay. And uh, what else uh, should uh, we take into account? Uh, can, arbitra uh, can arbitration award be made on the basis of document alone, which uh, some person has already mentioned? Can arbitration award uh, be done without any cross-examination? Of course, you can have some cross-examination online, but can cross-examination online be certainly confidential and reliable? Uh, since many company has been insolvent, uh, this uh, repetition that I have already stated, I, I can move on because I have a few time here. Uh, in terms of investment, is it possible or likely that the investor may abuse arbitration process? Uh, 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 for example, uh, by passing exhaustion of local remedies or ignoring cool off period and insisting that we have to go on. Uh, with the arbitration right away because we cannot wait for uh, for the consultation or something like that. Uh, it is uncertain uh, as to how arbitration will react to this issue uh, because the issue just arise and uh, you do not know uh, what would happen. Okay, and uh, can we uh, can we uh, do the arbitration online? Uh, this is undisputable because uh, several institutions, uh, for example, the ICC. Uh, arbitration rules, Article 25.2, or the anti trial arbitration rules, Article 20, uh, 28, uh, Paragraph 4. Uh, they say that uh, arbitration can, can be done online. Uh, however, hearing on merits of the case by video conference may affect uh, this uh, credibility. Uh, I have uh, heard uh, several arbitrators say that. Uh, some states say, say so, some say so. Uh, this is because cross examination may be intermittent. Uh, Sometimes you know you lost connection because the internet is poor in some country, uh, or some other cases or some other causes. Uh, witness may be assisted by someone uh, because we cannot know because you know uh, the camera just point out to your face <laughs> and not anywhere in the room anywhere in the room. Uh, and therefore, uh, the procedure may be uh, flawed some way or some way or another. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it may affect uh, investment, uh, enforcement, uh, according to the New York Convention. Okay. And uh, can the state, uh, in terms of ISDS, uh, the COVID, uh, I think, is uh, some say it's a false measure because nobody uh, knows or nobody uh, think of or nobody can envisage that it will occur uh, and will affect all countries in the world. Uh, it may be regarded as a force major, or it may be regarded as uh, a distress, or it may be regarded as necessity under a general international law. And uh, general international law can uh, be brought into uh, the arbitration process also. Okay. And uh, another interesting uh, case is that whether or not the host state can invoke the so-called police power. And it is interesting to note that I have uh, read one case, the Philip Morris and Uruguay, uh, which uh, was decided in 8 July uh, 2016. Philip Morris claims uh, that the Uruguay measures of increasing the area of each of the main sites of the cigarette package up to 80% for health warning uh, constitute direct expropriate, indirect expropriation of its asset according to the BIT principle of fair and equitable treatment. Uruguay, uh, on the other hand, defend that its measure is the exercise of the principle of uh, international or police power. The arbitrator, in this case, uphold the Uruguay defense. Yeah. And in this case, uh, the arbitrator uh, brings in uh, the general principle of international law. Uh, like, fan, like like uh, police power and something like that. So in my opinion, I think that if the principle of the police power can be involved to curb the danger of smoke cigarette to human health, which are limited to the number of people who smoke, uh, 
for a certain period of time. Uh, it, the principle can be for a fortiori, uh, justifying state measure to quarantine the COVID, which may cause massive death to a very large number of people in the shorter period of time. Yeah. It, it may be possible, okay. Now, I, I should conclude uh, because uh, some of the speaker has already mentioned about uh, the pro and con, uh, the benefit and the drawback. Uh, you can read just the, 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 the one in bold. Uh, the benefit of the online exchange is time reduction, uh, very clearly. Uh, cost reduction, uh, because you don't have to fly. You don't have to uh, pay for the uh, accommodation. And speedy process, uh, like several uh, uh, arbitrators, uh, speaker has already mentioned. But uh, you, you have also think about the drawback of online arbitration too. The first one is uh, technological disruption. What would happen if uh, you know the electricity is gone uh, right now? Yeah? You and I cannot speak here you know, because everything disrupt. Okay, time difference. Uh, I think uh, 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 Lars uh, has already mentioned time difference. Uh, at this time, uh, the day in in Thailand maybe the night uh, in the United States, uh, how can we do? Uh, if we uh, conduct the uh, arbitration here in Thailand during this time, uh, it is the sleeping time of uh, the respondent in uh, in the United States. How can we uh, solve that issue? Uh, it made lots of concentration during uh, long and not face-to-face -face interaction. Of uh, course, explanation and argumentation ineffective because uh, you can do, but uh, it not be as good as face-to-face -face, uh, cross examination. And uh, the last uh, and not least, I think, uh, is about the issue of uh, recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. Uh, one of the party to this view may claim that uh, the online uh, arbitration uh, is not uh, it's not fair. It's not uh, so good. It's not effective. Uh, due to uh, a variety of things that I have already mentioned. Uh, I, I think I should stop here because uh, it may take so long time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Sparrow, uh, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, for your interesting presentation and a lot of issues you raised. And and I feel that a uh, lot of uh, issues that you raised also uh, concerns me a lot because a lot of uh, uh, issues, legal issues, reflecting the uh, issues also happening in our legal system. Uh, but. Uh, but let's see what let, let's see in the discussion later. And thank you again for your presentation. And now I'd like to invite the participant if you have any questions to the speakers. Okay. So uh, I would like to uh, take a. I just took a very uh, short note on 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 uh, professor Scarico uh, presentations uh, two issues that uh, I think it is uh, important for the uh, development of the uh, innovation of rules the medium for the uh, conference, teleconference through the online medium uh, is the issue of the, <clears throat> uh, this is also the question uh, uh, frequently asked by my colleagues in Indonesia about the confidentiality of the procedures uh, made by the teleconference and also <clears throat> Uh, second issue is the uh, effectiveness of all of these uh, uh, innovative measures, uh, like uh, using the uh, Zoom technology and etc. The main issue is can 
as raised by Professor Suhariku, can the award made through this uh, medium be recognized and enforceable uh, in the other uh, jurisdiction uh, under the New York Conventions on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards? Uh, Steve or Lars, do you have any comment on these two issues, on the issue of uh, confidentiality and effectiveness of the award? Let, let me begin. I'm sure Lars will have something to, to add on to this. On the two points that, that you've raised, one is, uh, yes, I think there were initial concerns about uh, uh, what was called Zoom bombing uh, on the Zoom platform uh, and, and other medium like that. Uh, in, interestingly, the, um, the AAA I, ICDR uh, recommends uh, Zoom uh, for use for, for arbitration. Uh, and, and they actually have a tutorial online uh, as to how Zoom can be used uh, in this. And there are certain techniques you can use. There are certain techniques uh, within Zoom that would allow you to maintain confidentiality. One is you, you uh, would, uh, <clears throat> can set a password for meetings so people cannot join unless they have a password. You can set up the waiting room mm. so that the only people who join are the people admitted by the host. Uh, and so there are many techniques that can be used uh, to control who can attend the meeting. So it is possible to maintain confidentiality uh, on these platforms. And as I mentioned, the AAA uh, has uh, recommendations on this, as I'm sure other institutions would also have recommendations as how you can have uh, arbitration on uh, by this virtual medium safely. On the second question, uh, which is, is it enforceable? I think many, many institutions and, and many uh, arbitration laws, uh, the model law as well uh, re recognizes that uh, having a, a hearing doesn't mean you have to have it in person. Uh, what you need to have is, is a medium where you have the opportunity to hear the parties even before COVID-19 uh, hearings could have, could have been done by telephone conference or, or, or other means. So uh, unless, and I think this would be a very rare case, unless the arbitration rules or, or the, the arbitration law in a jurisdiction specifically says that a hearing has to be had in, in physical, uh, in a physical nature, then I think the, the rules and the laws, and this is the vast majority of the rules and laws, recognize that doing it online uh, is perfectly acceptable. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, to add, um, I, I also think that, that video conferencing is, uh, can be handled in a way that uh, confidentiality is preserved. Interestingly, um, it, it, it might help the diversity in arbitration uh, and, and help the younger generation of, of arbitrators uh, because they are usually quite, quite familiar with these uh, technical issues. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you can, you can, have handle, you can handle it in, in three ways. You, you pass the control over the Zoom to one of the parties. And I have to say, I, I don't like that that much. I don't want to have it in the hand of one party because suddenly the other party gets, gets muted during its opening statement. So you want to avoid that. Uh, the second option is if you have a very involved arbitral secretariat, um, and there are institutions that are very involved, the secretariat can take care of, of the handling of the Zoom. But the third option is to have the arbitrator handle the Zoom settings. And um, I personally, I have, I have done that. So I've done exactly what Stephen said. I had a waiting room. Uh, people had to come into the waiting room indicating their names. If, if they didn't, uh, they were asked like who has joined. Um, and you, could, you can even set breakout rooms um, so where, where people can, in a break, can meet in smaller groups. Um, so you actually have a lot of options to, to preserve confidentiality. I think the important thing is who handles it and, and who takes actually care of it. And I think that needs to be discussed uh, long before the actual virtual hearing. Um, on the second point uh, as, as to uh, arbitral awards, I, I fully agree with uh, Stephen because he made a, a distinction between in-person and physical. 
Um, I think we should call it, uh, we should distinguish between virtual hearings and physical hearings, because you could always say uh, meeting online, that is you meeting in person as well. Uh, it's probably not mm. exactly in the, in the sense of the common usage of, of that term. Um, but interestingly, the, the ICC arbitration rules, they have one provision that talks about meeting in person, at least in the English version of the rules. And they were very quick to, to uh, put out a, a clarification that that word in, or that term in person doesn't mean you cannot meet virtually. And so I would um, imagine that at least the sophist more sophisticated arbitral jurisdictions um, would have not such a big issue with, with an award that is based on a virtual hearing. Um, the safest way, of course, is always as an arbitrator to have the parties agree to a virtual hearing. And um, the three virtual hearings I've been involved in, in fact, the parties did agree. So, of course, it becomes more difficult if one party strongly objects. But uh, so, so far, I, I, in a way, I was lucky and, and there was always party agreement. Okay, and on the on the on on the on the uh, except uh, on the worldwide recognition of this uh, of this uh, award made through the uh, medium. Do you, do, do you think that uh, there should be uh, a worldwide recognition to ensure that the effectiveness of these uh, uh, efforts or medium uh, give uh, guarantee to the parties uh, that the, the award uh, in the end of the day will be recognized and and for this is i think still a, a concern to me because i agree with you uh, all of you but uh, my feeling is there should be an international agreement or international consensus in the world uh, giving assurance to the courts that they will uh, recognize it and they will enforce it uh, to give uh, confidence to the parties uh, using all of these technologies because uh, for example uh, some states and uh, this is my uh, personal observation and feeling they rely heavily on the positive law of their countries as long as uh, they contend that they they believe that if 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 they don't have a particular uh, or single uh, law or regulations or conventions stipulating that okay all of the all the online uh, arbitration award uh, settling international commercial dis uh, com uh, disputes uh, shall be recognized in my country. Or, uh, Professor Suhariko, do you have uh, additional comment or opinion on this issue? Thank you. Uh, uh, my opinion is that uh, in terms of uh, recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral award, the, the New York Convention may be uh, a bit outdated uh, at this moment because it has been uh, uh, drafted and agreed, uh, I think, 50 years ago, 1958, if my memory serves me well. At, at that time, nobody has uh, thought or contemplating about uh, the, the, the uh, emergence of the so-called internet uh, and, and the video conference. Uh, maybe uh, we can, uh, if, the, if, if all state parties to, to the New York Convention agrees, maybe we have to uh, amend uh, somewhat uh, on the New York Convention on recognition and enforcement of foreign and awards, uh, inserting uh, an articles to the effect that 
uh, an award made by uh, video conference uh, shall also be recognized uh, in the same manner as uh, the, 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 the actual awards uh, in paper, in paper. Uh, this is what we have. But as I understand, uh, I'm not so sure if uh, Amstral or ICC has already done. I have read an article somewhere that uh, they do uh, some uh, recognition and enforcement of foreign cultural award uh, in the similar manner as uh, as the uh, as New York Convention. Uh, it is a kind of a supplement, uh, not in place of the New York Convention. But I forgot whether it's the MC trial or the ICC. Maybe uh, uh, Stephen and Lars can can uh, can supplement me on that. Okay, uh, I, I think this is one way. And uh, in my opinion. Uh, Online arbitration has a large number of advantages. For example, it can save costs. It can make arbitration speedy. Uh, but uh, at this moment, I think it must be used uh, uh, together with uh, physical arbitration. Uh, half of the case can be done online, like submission of the uh, argumentations, uh, evidence, or something like that uh, on paper that can be done online. But uh, in terms of merits of the case, I think it is advisable that uh, all the parties uh, involved should uh, see each other physically and, and hear the decision. Thank you. This is my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Professor. <clears throat> uh, there is a, a, a question uh, raised by uh, I don't know who sent this. The question is, to improve the efficiency in arbitral proceeding, uh, will it be possible to create an instrument that allows the consolidation between related proceeding conducted under different digital rules? Uh, any comment on this? Uh, Lars or Stephen? Um, well, I, I can I can make a start. Um, so the interesting thing is, as long as you're under the same set of procedural rules, a lot of the rules now, that, that is another way to improve efficiency, and a lot of rules have taken this up, that they come up with uh, rules to consolidate proceedings. So um, clearly it's been recognized that consolidation can lead to efficiency. Now, when you have different uh, arbitral rules, uh, that's when it gets very difficult because then the question is, which of this, this set of arbitral rules is then guiding those consolidated proceedings? And probably no arbitral institution is happy to say, well, you know, um, I hand it over to you guys and we'll do it under your rules. And I, I, if, if I remember correctly, there was even a suggestion once um, to, to create an instrument uh, to, to allow for this. Um, and I think it was suggested by Gary Bourne, uh, but I, I, I don't think that um, has uh, garnered a lot of interest by the other arbitral institutions. So uh, I think the effort was made, um, but uh, so far I think there, there is just an inherent uh, bit of a competition um, that, that makes it very difficult to solve that issue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> any any more questions? Uh, uh, second questions raised by uh, Roland Amosu Guenu. How does virtual arbitration affect the seat? Okay, okay. How seat of arbitration? How do parties agree on uh, virtual seat, and how can the state court su support in case of need? This is also raised by Professor Suharifu <coughs> in your presentation. Uh, would like to make any comment on this, Professor or Steve? Stephen? Can you repeat your question again? Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. The device in my part is not so clear. 
Uh, the seat of arbitration, how do you de uh, determine uh, the seat of arbitration conducted by virtual arbitration? Uh, it's very difficult to, to answer because uh, right now, as I understand, uh, the, 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 the issue has not yet been resolved. Uh, as the, uh, the, 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 the hypothetical question that I have just raised, uh, if the complainant is in state A and the respondent is in state B, yes. okay, and the arbitrator is in uh, state C, and uh, uh, the, the uh, internet service provider is uh, in, in state D, okay. Uh, I, I'm not so sure on that, but uh, insofar as the New York Convention is concerned, Article 1, uh, Paragraph 1 say that uh, the New York Convention shall cover uh, any arbitration anywhere in the state, not uh, necessarily to be the contracting parties to uh, uh, to the New York Convention, but uh, Article One, Paragraph Three, say that uh, all state uh, when they uh, sign, uh, ratify, or access to the New York Convention, they may uh, declare that they will uh, accept or abide by the New York Convention. Uh, and that is to recognize and enforce foreign arbitral award just only for the state uh, which are uh, or which is uh, contracting parties to uh, to the New York Convention. The solution is that uh, it is on the uh, on the prudence of uh, the parties to dispute as well as the lawyers of the parties to dispute to make sure that uh, all the four uh, states are. Uh, uh, contacting parties to, to the New York Convention uh, for the sake of safety. Uh, that could be the solution. And that can be done very, uh, very easily because the lawyer is very prudent already. Uh, they, they should know uh, if the arbitrator is one state, if the complainant is another state, and uh, the respondent is the third state, and uh, the, the server is another state, uh, they have to make sure that all the four are contracting parties to, to the New York Convention. And that is the solution very easily. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I add on to this, uh, P Professor Adolf? Yes, please. Yeah. Steve, Stephen, yes, please. We do probably need to draw a distinction between um, completely online arbitration, and there's some talk about you know, having completely online arbitration, uh, and arbitrations which uh, are still located in a particular jurisdiction. So you would still have your standard arbitration clause, which says you would have arbitration in a particular uh, country, or you would agree to arbitration under certain uh, institutional rules. Uh, and in those situations, you, you, there is a mechanism for determining the seat. Uh, either the seat is agreed by the parties, or if it is not agreed by the parties, then uh, either the institutional rules provides how that would be determined, or if it's not provided, then usually the the law uh, you know, that that is applied by the uh, by by the tribunal may 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 also determine that it is it is possible. So when we're talking about you know, a lot of the discussion that we've been having uh, about using medium like like Zoom as such a hearings. Uh, it is not to say that we are removing ourselves uh, from the realm uh, of a, a arbitration that is seated in a particular locality. Uh, all of those requirements will still have to be met. It's just that we are using technology uh, as a means to facilitate bringing together people to have a hearing. Uh, and it's also a well-known you know, principle, is recognized in the model law and in many rules, that a hearing need not be held in the location of a seat. Uh, you, the, the seat is a juridical concept which, 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 which identifies what it's, which is the supervisory court of the arbitration and also identifies where this arbitration is made for the purposes of the New York Convention. But it's recognized that, you know, you, you, that's, you're taking ourselves out of the COVID world for the moment. Uh, it's it's quite it's well known that we could have an arbitration seated, say, a, in London, but the hearing would be in Paris for various reasons. And if you then 
transpose that to the COVID world that you have an arbitration seated in London, but the hearing is held via the online medium, uh, that doesn't create any particular concern. It doesn't create any dislocation of the seat because the seat remains London, however or wherever the hearing is held. Yeah, if I, if I may add uh, two points. Um, even before COVID-19, there were so-called e-arbitration providers. So smaller niche institutions that provided for so-called electronic arbitrations where, where it was clear people would not meet in person. And, and those arbitral institutions, they usually have a specific uh, default seat of the arbitration in the arbitration rules in case the parties forget to agree to it or cannot agree to it. So even, even, even before the pandemic, that, that was well acknowledged. Now, uh, the final point is, unfortunately, we don't have a, a French lawyer in our midst. Uh, I, I think there is a French doctrine of, of delocalized uh, international arbitration that basically says we don't need a seat of the arbitration. But I, I think that has remained a minority view. Thank, thank you. It's very interesting. <clears throat> and and the second question. Uh, thank you, Quen uh, Du. Uh, How then uh, the state court uh, can support? Uh, how can how can the parties agree on the future, and how can the state court support in case of need? So, uh, the, uh, in my feeling, how can we convince the state court that uh, that yes, it it. It's very important questions, but uh, it reaches again to my previous uh, concern about the uh, the state court, which will recognize and enforce the the even. About this uh, second question raised by uh, Guenu. Mark or Mark, do you have any comment on this? I'll, I'll give it the first try. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll split it again in two parts. I think the first worry is are courts at all friendly towards arbitrations that have been conducted via virtual hearings? And I think that very much uh, depends on the jurisdiction because now you do have jurisdictions. I mean, it's in, in London, in, in, in Germany, in, in Korea. Uh, there, there's quite a lot of jurisdictions where even the court conduct their hearings virtually. Um, so I think it would be strange for a court to say, well, I conduct my hearings virtually, but if it's done in an arbitration, there's something wrong with it. So I, I would hope at least for those jurisdictions, um, th those courts would be a bit more open. Now, I, I of course see um, that that doesn't apply to all jurisdictions. So for those who don't conduct uh, virtual hearings in courts, uh, a different solution has to be found. Um, and, and I think Professor Adolf already said, maybe, maybe a national law has to be amended. The arbitration law has to be amended to expressly allow it. Um, the, the second question is how can courts uh, generally support? And I don't think uh, there is a big uh, difference. Uh, it, it depends a little bit on what we mean by support. But a lot of the support um, granted by courts at the seat of the arbitration is, for example, if there is a challenge to an arbitrator um, and, and that is uh, brought before the courts. Um, I think the courts could support or a, or, or a request for the help with the taking of evidence. Um, again, uh, I think that the courts could, could support. I, I think just the fact that the arbitration is different in this one aspect that uh, there might be a virtual hearing down the, the, the line. I'm not sure where the courts then would say, well, I don't support in, in the taking of evidence in, in, in uh, arbitrated challenges in a challenge to the jurisdiction of, of the tribunal.
Thank you. And Professor Suhari Hul, do you have a comment on this? Uh, I think that uh, the court, uh, uh, in my opinion, will generally support uh, the arbitral award, even if uh, it is done online. Uh, as I see it, uh, I think there is no provision in the New York Convention which prohibits the conduct of uh, arbitration online. <laughs> Just the problem of recognition, because the online arbitration may have some irregularity on the proceedings. And that is why uh, it may cause uh, some party to raise the irregularity. And therefore, uh, the court may, uh, may not recognize and uh, enforce the arbitral award. But it's not the, the uh, New York Convention itself which prohibits. But it is the procedural uh, irregularities which may occur. That is the question. But if you have done everything online on a fair uh, basis, uh, on a confidentiality basis, uh, I see nothing uh, why the uh, national court will not recognize the arbitral awards. And that's my opinion. Thank you. Yes. Uh, if I may add my observation to question raised by Gwenu. I think the architect of New York Convention, Professor Peter Sers from uh, Netherlands, uh, he just required a requirement for the enforcement, a recognition enforcement the, of the award. Uh, Professor Sanders uh, only requires the a copy of the uh, arbitration agreement or clause, arbitration clause, and also the translation of uh, the, the official language of the award in the national language where the <coughs> enforcement as I said, there is no uh, uh, the architect of this uh, convention does not uh, did not see that the medium the 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 medium the teleconference or the the how the people's uh, the arbitration is conducted. It is not the issue of the New York Convention. The issue is the, uh, if the, the only issue, two requirement only uh, uh, as mentioned in Article 1 and Article 3 of the New York Convention. So the problem is when, the is, when one party issue that, okay, uh, the, uh, they propose or they, they request the, 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 the the non-execution of the award because of the conduct of the arbitration is met not through the uh, the ordinary hearing. That I think the problem is is to convince the state court how they would like how they can see the spirit of the convention. So. I agree with all of you that is the, the, the teleconference, the Zoom is only a medium. It is only a means to help the parties settle the dispute efficiently, effectively. So uh, this is what the court, the national court, state court uh, should understand uh, uh, the spirit of efficiency and uh, effectivity in settling the dispute through uh, through uh, <clears throat> through uh, electronic means. Still, a uh, question raised by uh, participants, Roland Guenu, but because of the time, uh, I, thank you of uh, the excellent presentations, uh, wonderful 
uh, presentation of the speakers. Thank you, uh, Stephen, Stephen Lim, Mark, uh, <coughs> Market, and Professor Tanes Hariku. And uh, uh, I would like to say also thank you to the participants. So I have to end the uh, seminar today, this afternoon, on behalf of the Thailand Arbitration Center, I would like again to say thank you and goodbye.